Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone's having a good day or a great day so far. Uh, as you can see, Joe is not here today. He's on vacation. And, um, but we are blessed to have Liz Walker back with us uh, and look forward to her sermon today. As far as announcements go, uh, please be sure to remember the friends and family of Neil, uh, Sally Farmer. The arrangements we've just discovered, well, we knew they were going to be Thursday, but now we know that it's going to be Thursday at 1 o'clock, and Buster Timmons will be officiating. Um, on Tuesday, Joe is starting a grief support group, and they will meet at 1 o'clock in the parlor. It's for anybody who is, um, has lost a loved one, anyone who has lost any other thing or grieving about anything, so please be sure to join them. Family suppers are starting back this Wednesday, and um, please be sure to uh, call the office and make reservations. Uh, they are also going to have some uh, games, I believe, Wednesday to kind of take the place of the MYF and the Chemco not um, taking place. Next Sunday on the 11th, right after church, we're going to have the uh, council meeting. Uh, we'll be discussing plans for Liberty Day and other summer activities. Saints Alive will be June 20th. And even though the bulletin says that Kimco and MYF will meet Wednesday, they have uh, a quit meeting during the summertime. And one last announcement is that communion, which we would have normally had today, will be next Sunday. Now, if you'll please bow your heads for a moment of prayer. Dear Lord, be with us today as we worship and celebrate you. Thank you for this church and all the people who are a part of it. Please be with those who are unable to be here today and be with each of us as we go forward in the coming week. Thank you for all that you do, all that you are, and being a part of our lives. We can't do it without you. In your most holy name, amen. Now, if you'll please stand and uh, turn to page 26 in the Modern Worship Book. We're going to sing Raise a Hallelujah, followed by Blessed Be the Name on page 39.
Remain standing as we affirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed found on page 881. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. be seated. Let us go to God in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, on this Trinity Sunday, we admit that there's so much that we don't understand about your triune nature. But we can also sit here assured of how much you love us and are always present with us. And that is something to be grateful for. Thank you so much for sending your son to die for our sins. Thank you so much for the gift of the Holy Spirit who guides us each and every day. We are so grateful. But we also, some of us sitting here, are hurting, are suffering. Some in pain, some in need of healing, some with heavy hearts for the world, the community, family members, so I'd like to take a moment of silence so that we can lift up in our hearts all that we need for you to carry because it's too heavy for us to do on our own. We are grateful, God, that your burden is light. Help us to whatever we just handed over to you to not take back in this next moment. Because we trust you. And we know that no matter the circumstance, you are working it all for the good. And we thank you. Help us, Lord, to see what you see in us. Help us, Lord, to see what you see in others. As we know that you value the importance of community because you yourself are one, but also three. We are going to need your guidance as we leave this place today and enter into the mission field. Because we as humans are not enough. We cannot do it without you. We don't want to do it without you. So please be with us as we go out into the world and share your good news of grace and love and peace. Help us to be encouragers in a world that needs encouraging. 
Help us to be unifiers in a world that desperately needs unity. Help us to be peace-filled even when things aren't peaceful. And God, even when we cannot find the words to pray, we are so grateful that Jesus taught his disciples the prayer that we are about to, with confidence, say together today, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, will the ushers come forward, please? Please bow your heads. Lord, you have blessed us and loved us in so many ways. We pray that these gifts we are about to receive will be used to shower blessings on others and help to bring more disciples to you. Amen. For the hymn. Mm -hmm. Please remain standing as we sing all three verses of Blessed Assurance found on page 369 of your United Methodist hymnal. Thank you. 
Today's scripture reading comes from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 13, verses 11 through 14. Hear the word of the Lord. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice, strive for full restoration, encourage one another, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All God's people here send their greetings. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Well, good morning again. It is an honor and a privilege to be back here worshiping with you today and to get to share this message with you. I hope you had a happy Pentecost last Sunday, and I'm not going to lie, I was relieved to not have to preach last Sunday and read all of those hard names and places and the Pentecost scripture from the book of Acts. Well, relieved until Pastor Joe's, and I quote, said, Well, liturgically, the Sunday you will preach will be Trinity Sunday, in case you want to wade into the treacherous waters of Trinitarian theology. Thanks, Pastor Joe. Um, To be honest, last year I was in charge of the children's moment at our church on Trinity Sunday, and I couldn't even write that, much less an entire sermon on the Trinity. So let me go ahead and ease your mind now. I'm not going to pull out any of the bad analogies for the Trinity for us today. I'm not going to take an egg and show that the white and the yolk and the shell, because those are actually three unalike parts, so that one doesn't work. Um, I'm not going to take water and then freeze it and then vaporize it as another bad example, because one single water molecule cannot exist in all three states of matter at one time. And thankfully, I didn't pick any three-leaf clovers to show the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But I am 100% guilty of speaking in an Irish accent during a children's moment one March a few years ago, and it may or may not have started with, top of the morning to you lads and lassies. And so um, I promise now that I know better, I will do better. So, So welcome to Trinity Sunday. And although I'm not going to wade in the treacherous waters of Trinitarian theology or use bad analogies to underexplain the Trinity, I do want to take a moment and acknowledge why this scripture was chosen for Trinity Sunday and give you some applications for our lives moving forward as those who believe in the Trinity. So before moving forward, let us begin by reflecting on this nature of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. It is a divine mystery, a perfect communion of love, harmony, and unity. And within this triune relationship, we see encouragement, support, and a shared purpose. From the commentaries I've read, 2 Corinthians 13, 14, or it is actually verse 13 in some translations, in its original context, Paul isn't necessarily explicitly teaching on the Trinity here to the Corinthian church, but in relation to this scripture being chosen for today's purposes, the Center for Excellence in Preaching writes, Given this Sunday's relentless call to Christians to live in community, it might be appropriate to think of the community that is the Trinity 
working to deepen the community that is Christ's church. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, who are always serving each other tirelessly, work together to help us, God's adopted sons and daughters, faithfully serve both God and each other. As children of God, created in his image, we are called to mirror this divine unity in our relationships with one another. So in order to avoid those treacherous waters Pastor Joe speaks of, I am now going to refer to today as Community Sunday instead. So happy Community Sunday. And on this Community Sunday, we're going to search our souls and hopefully stir our souls a little on how we can best serve both God and each other. And thankfully, Paul gave the Corinthians some good advice in his final greetings that still apply to us today. So let's take a look. In verse 11, Paul says to encourage one another. In our fast-paced and often isolating society, encouragement has become a precious commodity. We live in a world where many are weighed down by burdens, doubts, discouragement. And as the body of Christ, we have the opportunity and the responsibility to provide a lifeline of encouragement to one another. Through our words, our actions, and presence, we can uplift and inspire others, reminding them of their worth, their gifts, their purpose in God's kingdom. Let us be intentional in offering genuine and heartfelt encouragement to our fellow believers, spurring one another towards love and good deeds. We can offer words of encouragement, support, and affirmation to uplift one another. But encouragement is not nearly a kind word or a superficial gesture. It goes deeper than that. And it involves seeing the potential and the unique gifts in others and helping them to recognize and develop those gifts. It means offering a listening ear, a comforting presence, words that inspire hope, Encouragement is about helping others believe in themselves and reminding them that they are loved and valued by God. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, encourage one another and build each other up. So I have a few questions for you. When was the last time you slowed down and shared a word of encouragement with someone? We all know that people often hear from the squeaky wheels and the negative, but how often do you send a text or an email or even write a handwritten note letting someone know you're thinking about them, praying for them, or thanking them for a job well done? I know as a teacher, we get those responses far less often than the ones mentioned previously. So when I do get an encouraging note, I save it to refer back to on a rainy day. I actually have an entire email folder labeled, read these on a rainy day and I have notes hanging on my cork board behind my desk. If you can't remember the last time you encouraged someone in this way, that's okay. You can be intentional about the next time. When was the last time you practiced the ministry of presence? Perhaps you took a moment just to be present and listen to someone when they needed to process. It sometimes takes putting your agenda to the side and choosing relationship over ritual to truly be where your feet are and give someone else your undistracted attention. The gift of our time, after all, is sometimes the most precious but also so encouraging to the one you're sharing the time with. If you can't remember the last time you encouraged someone in this way, that's okay. You can be intentional about the next time. When was the last time you not only encouraged someone, but you took the time to build them up by reminding them of their gifts and their purpose? I belong to a small group that meets on Sunday nights, and we did an exercise one week where we did just that. Some of us have been in the group for about a year, and others have been in the group for several years. We had just studied spiritual gifts, and our leader provided us with a stack of note cards. Before the next Sunday, we all took our note cards home to complete an exercise. We were to write a card to each group member 
identifying and affirming their gifts. We describe the gifts we saw clearly in each person, and beneath each gift, we added a few words describing how and where we've seen this gift in them. We also mentioned gifts that we saw like potential in each person. And then the next Sunday, we exchanged our cards and we all shared out a little bit. It's amazing the power and the clarity that comes when people see in you what you can't always see in yourself. Talk about a community that encourages one another and builds one another up. If you can't remember the last time you encouraged someone in this way, that's okay. You can be intentional about the next time. After encouragement, Paul then emphasizes the importance of being of one mind. In other translations, it's worded to be in harmony with one another. Paul here emphasizes the importance of striving for unity. We witness consequences of division and polarization, communities, families, the church. And it doesn't mean that unity is that we all think alike or agree on every issue. It means recognizing our common purpose and setting aside our personal agendas for the greater good. As followers of Christ, we are called to transcend these divisions and pursue unity. We are called to be of one mind, to work together, and to embrace our shared identity as followers of Christ. And remember, it doesn't mean uniformity. It's not the same thing. I read a book once called Unshakable Hope by Max Licato. And he speaks of unity being of one mind, working together in and through diversity, much like Paul does by asking his readers to consider an orchestra. To create the harmony needed for a beautiful sound, it takes all types of different instruments playing all different notes. Some instruments are shinier than others, and some instruments are louder than others, and some instruments only play the harmony notes, which, by the way, without any of the other instruments would actually sound quite dreadful. Um, yet, if we only had the melody notes, the sound would definitely be lacking depth. All instruments are needed. All notes are needed to be complete. One not more important than the other. One not able to make a complete sound without the other. This is much like we as the body of Christ work together to serve God and others in community through our diverse gifts. Every gift is needed. Every member has a gift. Max Licato also shares in that same book that the Holy Spirit distributes gifts according to what the church will need in a particular region and season. Now, we cannot deny that we are in a tough season in our world, in our domination, everywhere. But to everything, there is a season. And our bishop at last year's conference said it best when she said, and it's always the right season to make disciples. When gifts are active, the church is empowered to do the work for which it was intended. When was the last time you used your spiritual gifts alongside others to be the hands and feet of Christ in your congregation or your community? Are you aware of your spiritual gifts? Are you aware of others' spiritual gifts? Have you explored opportunities in your congregation and community to ignite and unite together using these gifts? If you can't remember the last time you united and ignited in this way, that's okay. You can be intentional about the next time. Gone is the excuse, I just can't work alongside so-and-so. Max Lucado says, well, maybe you can't work alongside so-and-so, but the spirit within you can. We are one in the spirit, as one of my favorite songs says, and that one spirit provides us with the gifts and the direction and the guidance necessary to accomplish God's work together. After all, you can't even say community without saying unity, so we need it. Along with encouragement and unity, Paul so all also advises us to live in peace. Now talk about something that is easier said than done. I do think that encouragement and harmony that we've already mentioned do affect this living in peace, but I also think it's worth mentioning separately here, as Paul does as well. In the midst of our daily struggles and uncertainties and anxieties, 
We can find comfort and peace in knowing that God is always with us. His love and his peace are available to us. And his peace is not a temporary peace tied to circumstances. His peace allows us to be peace-filled even when things aren't peaceful. One of my favorite Bible studies I've ever done was the armor of God. This was a study by Priscilla Shire, and I've actually done it like over five times. Um, And each time I do it, my favorite piece of armor are the shoes of peace. She uses Philippians 4, 6 through 7 as the driving scripture for that armor piece. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Two key words, with thanksgiving, she says with gratitude. Gratitude is what activates our shoes of peace. The peace of Christ is in us thanks to what he did for us on the cross. And even in the midst of dire circumstances, there's always something to be grateful for. This peace beyond comprehension is activated when we take the time to be grateful. The backdrop of commotion is actually the best place for the peace of God to be put on display. So when was the last time you added thanksgiving and gratitude to your prayers and supplications? Are gratitude lists part of your daily spiritual practice and discipline? Do you journal these thoughts and praises down? Do you jot them in your notes app on your phone? Do you talk to God aloud when you're in your car alone? Do you share them around your dinner table before you eat? This gratitude will, much like the spikes on the bottom of the soldier's cleats, that was the image, after all, that Paul was describing when he was describing the armor of God, this gratitude will act like these spikes, and that will allow you to stand firm in peace no matter the circumstance. If you can't remember the last time you felt peace, this grounded peace in this way, That's okay. You can be intentional about the next time. But just like anything else, this peace isn't just about you. It isn't just for you. These spikes on the soldier's cleats also help them to form a strong, impenetrable battle line against the enemy. It's important for them as individuals to have sure footing, doing their individual part, Because if even one lost their footing, the whole formation could weaken. So we as individuals must strive to live in peace for ourselves, but also for our congregation and community as well. To the extent that the individuals are armed for battle, so too is the church. One believer united in peace with one another is prepared to stand as one warrior. Your church Your community needs you to stand firm in that peace of God that surpasses all comprehension. Activate your shoes of peace with praise and gratitude. And let's all stand firm and move forward together. Priscilla's father actually is the famous pastor and author Tony Evans, and he's often been quoted about peace. He says, peace does not mean that you will not have problems. Peace means that your problems will not have you. Imagine what the community can do if our individuals act for that kind of peace, in that kind of peace, from a place of that peace. So a few final questions. How will you respond to these final greetings from Paul today? What is something you can do today to apply his advice on this Trinity, or newly named Community, Sunday? What's something you can do next week? How will you respond? My footnote for this scripture in my Wesleyan study Bible says, their response, including their relationships with each other in the wider church, is vital. So therefore, our response, including our relationships with each other in the wider church, is vital. So on this Trinity Sunday, this Community Sunday, I pray that moving forward, we allow the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit 
who are always serving each other tirelessly to work together to help us faithfully serve both God and each other. May we be encouragers in a discouraging world. May we be unifiers in a dividing world. May we be peace-filled in a world that is not peaceful. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the gift of your word and for how the Holy Spirit keeps it active and alive in our lives. I pray that we are able to take this message from you today and apply it as we move forward together in unity, in peace, in encouragement, for the glory of you, your name. Amen. Now, if you will, please um, stand, and we are going to sing verses 1 and 4 of Trust and Obey, which is found on page 467. So verses 1 and 4 of Trust and Obey. about to enter the mission field. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. <laughs>